All righty, good morning. You guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. Good to see everyone today. Welcome, all those online and uh, all those in person. It's good to see everyone today. Uh, go ahead and on the, the YouTube app, hit like, hit subscribe. It helps boost it to more people. We want to get the word out about what God is doing at Trinity. We're in week three of this series, The Lion and the Dragon. And we started with angels. Uh, last week we did demons. If you missed those two, they're on our YouTube channel, on our podcast. Today we're doing judgment, and then we're finishing this up next week with paradise. In the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, it refers to Jesus uh, looking like a, or being a lion. It refers to Satan being a dragon. Those are apt metaphors to help us visualize and describe the, the struggle between uh, good and evil. If you're somebody skeptical or you know somebody skeptical, these, the spiritual claims of the Bible can be hard for people in our context to really buy into. One very quick way that we've helped people bridge the gap between their skepticism and the spiritual realities of the Bible is to understand the idea of the multiverse, this idea that a scientific view of the world, that there exists a, a myriad, an infinite amount of variations of every possible reality that could exist. And so because of that, it's not just probable that there exists a reality where everything in the Bible is true. There must exist a reality where everything in the Bible is true, and that's the reality uh, that we are in. At least that's what we believe at Trinity. Not that we believe in the multiverse, but that we believe everything in the Bible. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say. So today we're going to be uh, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Uh, if you've got a Bible, you can get ready. You can turn there. It will come up on the screen as well. Talking about judgment today. This is, judgment is one of the hardest subjects for Christians to talk about, for preachers to handle. There's a few uh, topics, you know, as a, as a short list of things that are really tricky subjects to speak on in, in our context, in our day and age. Judgment is, is up there. And in part because we're now in, in a, our, our culture is very fragile, very sensitive, and we view pain, all forms of pain, as being completely wrong. And so we're, you know, thankfully we're more aware of trauma and we're, we're sensitive to that and we recognize that people's trauma needs to be identified and healed and that people need to be healed from their trauma. But unfortunately, we're in a context where even, even our traumas have become really associated with our, some of our core identity. You can even be weaponized against other people. And so speaking about the idea that God has a penalty for our wrongdoing is extremely offensive in our context, extremely difficult to handle and to talk about. Now, of course, God does not take any pleasure in pain. He takes no ple pleasure in pain whatsoever. So we've got to be careful that the sentiments of our day and age don't dictate our thinking, but God's Word shapes our thinking, and that we understand that God is a God of love, yes, but also a God of justice. And love and justice have to go together. Love and justice always goes, go together. They come from God's nature. In fact, our generation, our culture, we believe that recompense and consequence, without recompense and without consequence, that justice is impossible. And so in a generation that's crying out for justice, we cannot deny God His cosmic justice. There is a difference between, we can delineate between judgment and punishment, two different things. Judgment is a determination, a decision, an assessment of how severe our wrongdoings are. That's judgment. And then punishment is then the outworking, the consequence, the application of the judgment. Let's get into God's Word today. Let's pray, and then we're going to read from Matthew 13. Jesus, we need your help. This is a hard subject. It can offend us. It can cause us to struggle. Help us to understand it. Help us to believe it, and help us to adjust our lives to it. And God, I pray for those who don't know you, that they would have an awareness of what is right and what is wrong and the consequence, the justice that's deserved for what is right and what is wrong. And I pray that you would, you would work in our church today and all those online, all those in person, Lord, that you would do a mighty, mighty work. You'd set us free from the forces of darkness and help us turn to you and know you. Save us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. Jesus, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. 
So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. We're going to jump to verse 36, continuing in verse 36. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And the disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is God's Word. Jesus is famous for teaching parables. Parables are short stories with a really big point to them. And most parables have one big point that they're getting at. They might have some secondary or tertiary or subpoints to them as well, but there's really one big idea that it's trying to get across. And so the challenge with parables is to not stretch them beyond where they should go. So for example, you know, uh, Christians are referred to as wheat and the sons of God's kingdom, the, the wheat that grows up and they're put in the barn. So that's an image of us being safe in heaven in God's house. And so what we can't do is we can't say then, we can't continue the parable with something like this notion where we say like, well, God, you know, then takes the wheat and grinds us up into flour and bakes us in the oven and makes freshly sliced bread and covers it in butter and then devours us for dinner. Like, that's breaking the parable. That's, you're pushing it too far when you're doing this. You've got to be really careful. Uh, that's obviously a silly example. Uh, you wouldn't hopefully do that. Uh, but you have to be careful when, with the parable that it's trying to get certain things across, and you've got to be careful you don't verge into things that it's not saying. This parable is in large part, mostly, about judgment specifically Judgment Day. It's undeniable this concept of judgment, and specifically a day of judgment, is throughout the Bible. It's undeniable. You actually see moments of judgment throughout biblical history. So you could think of Noah's Ark as being uh, one of these examples where God judged people. That generation was so corrupt that God judged them. And then, so you see a few judgments, but it appears to us that there's a culmination of judgment, that there will be a day when God will hold all people accountable. It's an awesome and, frankly, terrifying idea. So in Acts chapter 17, we're told, Acts 17 verse 31, it says, He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. Obviously, it's talking about Jesus. Again, at the end of the Bible in Revelation 20, we're told of this final conflict that happens between satanic forces and God's forces. And it says that the devil deceives the nations and he gathers them together and that they then wage an all-out attack, an all-out war on believers. And it looks pretty dire. It looks pretty terrible. There are some crazy things that happen. But at the last second, it says that fire falls from the sky and consumes the forces of evil. And that in the end, it's a decisive victory. And then after that scene, it's then said that everyone, great and small, are before a white throne. Every life will be before the throne. And then it says books are opened. 
and everybody's life will be laid bare. Everyone will be held accountable. Everyone's life will be evaluated and assessed and looked at. Now, it's, a, it's an awesome idea that God will hold everyone accountable for what they've done, a terrifying idea. But also for Christians in our day and age, it can be an embarrassing idea, an idea that we just wish, like, man, I just wish my pastor wouldn't ever talk about this subject. Why do people have to preach on this or mention this? Or when I do my Bible reading, I, don't, I want to flip over those passages and get to all the nice passages. Some, because of this, some people modify their, their faith, modify their theology, make it more palatable. Others walk away from their faith because they just can't imagine. They just can't square it away. They can't put it together. How do we respond? How do we think about this? Strangely, we can actually uh, le- <laughs> we can look to the world, actually, very strangely, uh, at least in one way. Let me explain what I mean by this, to help us with this. All major world religions, uh, let me start with the, the, the theistic religions, all major world religions believe in judgment, and specifically a judgment day. So obviously Christianity does, Judaism does, Islam does, uh, Hinduism has uh, judgment built into it as well, Sikhism does, uh, even the pantheistic religions, even uh, Buddhism has forms of judgment within it. It's very common, in, even in a Western context, to believe in Eastern ideas, ideas like karma, right? So, so actually people who believe in karma, it's a very common idea, isn't it? Something bad, someone does something bad, and then something bad happens to them, people will snigger and say like, it's that karma. It's come, you know, what goes around comes around, right? This idea that, that we have in our culture, culture that there's a blind force at work in the universe that is constantly giving out judgment for people based on their evil works. So we actually, you know, we should be comforted by, by the fact that most world religions believe in judgment. Even atheists, they obviously deny cosmic judgment, but, but, but I, most atheists I can think of have a strong sense of justice. They want judgment to be properly administered. And of course, they're talking about this life, but they want the judicial system to work properly. They want crimes to be punished. They, they believe in that. Lots of people have a very strong moral sense that judgment is a necessary thing, to, not just to deter crime, to stop people from doing wrong things, but also to give consequences for people who have done things. They should pay the penalty for what they've done. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, it's funny then. Who is it that has all the problems with judgment? Who is it? And I realized, it, was, it actually kind of made me laugh when I, it hit me when I was reading this. I realized there's kind of a, a group, a kind of a new wave kind of, of, of Christians, I don't know if you could call them Christians actually, who leave the pages of the Bible and want to modify faith, want to modify Jesus, want to modify the Scriptures, want to twist them and distort them because they just don't like this, these ideas. These ideas don't feel right to them. And so they... They, they leave the confines of the Bible and the truth revealed in God's Word, and they settle for something else. Leonardo da Vinci would have something to say to them. Let's show this uh, Leonardo da Vinci quote that we have. Famously says this, He who does not punish evil commands it to be done. He who does not punish evil commands it to be done. Let's look at the reasons that judgment is good. The reasons that judgment is good. Number one, Judgment, it reveals God's righteousness. If you become aware of a human judge who is soft on crime, maybe you can think of some, a human judge soft on crime, somebody who misapplies the law or takes a bribe or, or unequally you know, applies the law and so lets some people off the hook when they shouldn't, when we see that, we know that's an injustice. We know this person is morally corrupt. They're supposed to be doing justice in the world, but they're actually perpetuating injustice. And so we say this is a morally corrupt person. They need to be removed from their position. They're not good. They're doing evil. Consider God, who is judge of all things, who sees all things and knows all things. If we deny God judgment, what we do is we actually turn God into a permissive parent, the worst type of parent, and we turn God from a good God into an evil God. Second reason judgment is good is that it rings true with our own sense of justice. It rings true with our own sense of justice. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, Revelation 6, verse 10, it tells us, it says about Christian martyrs, those who have died for their faith, it says they cried out, so they're in heaven, it says they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. These people are in God's presence. They know the grace and the bliss and the 
the, the awe and the wonder of being in God's presence. Is there something wrong with this desire, this heart cry of saying, when are you going to avenge our blood? When are you going to deal back to those who have taken our lives from us? When are you going to judge them and hold them accountable for what they've done? We understand deep down there's something very right about this sense of like calling out for wrongs to be properly made right, to, for, them, for there to be a penalty for what's been done wrong. The third reason that the judgment is good is that it enables us to forgive. Now, this might seem contradictory to point number two, but I'll reconcile them in just a second. Because God is judge, we can have full confidence that he will properly administer justice. It's out of our hands. And so he'll, he'll do justice in, in one, of, one of two ways. Either people, justice will be done and judgment will be correct, either because people will put their trust in Jesus and then their sins will be taken on by Jesus, that Jesus will receive their, their punishment and their judgment, which will then satisfy that. So, so the cry of the martyrs then is, is still true because it will still be sat- can be satisfied in what Jesus has done or, or God will, they will have to bear their sin themselves. Either way, it enables us to forgive those who have wronged us because we know either way God will set this right. I, I, I can't affect it. All that's left is for me to forgive, is for me to let it go because I have, no, I have really no say in this process. The fourth reason that judgment is good is that it actually motivates people to believe. Now, of course, there are some people that just won't believe, right? And, and, and judgment is maybe one reason in a, in a long list of things where they might, won't believe. You know, people will say, well, hasn't science disproved the Bible or... If God's a good God, how can there be you know, evil and suffering? All these kind of big things. You know, the record of Christians throughout history, like how can you believe in a religion where people have done these things? You know, people have all their reasons, and judgment is just another reason. So it's not really judgment that's doing it. It's, it's, it's really you know, the, the, the deeper issue of the heart not really want, desiring God in the first place. That's obviously the big reason. But people have their reasons. But that's not most people. Most people believe in a divine force. Most people believe in a higher power. You can't, as a human being, you can't really stop doing that. You have to believe in something greater because that's the way God's designed us. Designed us. It's part of our basic makeup is that we have to believe in something bigger. We have to believe in God. We're searching for God. And so for most people who believe in a divine force in the universe, perhaps this is you here today, perhaps someone online. You, you, maybe you're not, your, your Christian status is ambiguous. You're, you're uncertain if you're a believer or maybe you know, you're not a believer in Jesus, but you're spiritual. You believe in some kind of divine force. To introduce the idea that the maker of the universe will hold everyone accountable for their sin is such, I mean, it's a powerful idea that would make, that does make people question, well, maybe I need to take Jesus a bit more seriously. Maybe I naturally need to face the things I've done, the, 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 the wrong things I've done. I can't just be thinking spiritual things. I've got to be thinking about right and wrong, good and evil. There's such clear categories. You know, the, the work of, 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 of the enemy, the work of, of culture as well as to blur those things, to constantly blur the lines between those things and to deceive us into darkness. And, and God is constantly delineating and separating those things and showing us that they're completely uh, different from one another. So for those who do believe in some kind of divine force, the idea of judgment is profoundly impacting. Think about it this way, that without consequences, is there any reason? What's the point in doing good? Why do good? Now, you might say, well, it just feels better to do good. Really? We don't think that people are doing wrong things and getting a lot of pleasure out of those wrong things they're doing? I mean, some people's consciences might be stronger than others. I get it. But people do wrong things because they like it. In fact, without judgment, what is the point of salvation? You need no salvation if there is no judgment. In fact, if you erase judgment, you erase the cross. You erase the death of Jesus. You erase almost everything in the Bible. You get rid of all of it. Because you don't need to be saved. There's nothing to be saved from in the end. This is why judgment is good. That's why it's necessary. The other reason, the fifth reason that judgment is good is that it fuels us to share our faith. It fuels us to share our faith. You know, spiritually speaking, unbelievers are, are lost. You know, it's not good to be lost. I don't you know if you get lost, you know, it's very unnerving. I'm, I don't know where I am. Something bad could happen to me. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. People are waiting for me. What could happen? People are lost. They're, they're, they're spiritually up the creek without a paddle. You know, they're, and, and, and the Scripture tells us that, that, that God wants all people to be saved. That, that has, He's gone to great lengths. He doesn't really want people to perish. He sent His Son because he, he, he loves people and He wants people to be saved, to come into His kingdom. He's gone to great lengths 
to actually save people from this coming judgment, from the consequences of their own sin. And so when we think about judgment, it should be very motivating to us to say, I really need to tell people this message. People are facing this. I was facing this. And other people are facing this. I need to tell them about this. Let me take a second to talk about something that our church is going to be doing uh, this fall. In two weeks after this series, we're going to be starting something special. And the reason we're doing this is because I'm, I'm tired of being on defense. I feel like over the, la- over the last year and a half, our church, we've been on defense. We've been in survival mode. And you know, there's lots of churches have been experiencing this with the pandemic and other things going on. It's like there's just, we're just surviving. We're in defense. We're just trying to keep things together. And I'm tired of that. I want our church to get back on mission, back on the purposes of God. And so we're going we're gonna to go on offense big time. So we're going to be doing we're going to be doing this thing called Alpha. Alpha is a it's typically a small group curriculum. Uh, it comes out of the UK, comes out of uh, Nikki Gumbel's church, Holy Trinity Brompton, and it's really it's it's a foundational Christian course, so it is good for Christians as well. But it's typically designed for people who are exploring the Christian faith to uh, enter into a, a discussion, a dialogue about uh, Christianity, and to answer big questions about life. And so what uh, we've done this in our church. Uh, Semi recently, we did one online, um, and basically, you know, I talk to people about Alpha, and we try and get people to do Alpha. And some, every so often, you know, people are up for doing it, but a lot, a lot of times, people are like, "Well, I just don't know what it is. I've never done it before." So I'm like, "I'm going to solve this problem once and for all. We're all going to go through it together. All right. So on Sunday mornings, we're going to go through it. It's a video curriculum. I'll be sharing a little bit each Sunday, but mainly the videos will be the topic, and uh, it's to so we're going to do like about eight weeks. Those are all the different topics. And we're going to expose our church to this. And every week, I'm going to be asking the question, who do you know? Who's in your life? Who's in my life that I could invite to this al- to Alpha? Now, we could, you, we could bring people to this series as we do it on Sundays. That's fine. We could do that. But really, this is warming us up for next year, for ne- the next semester of groups beginning uh, at the beginning of next year. We want to do an Alpha small group. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work yet. It might be online, it might be in person, it might be both, it might be in our building here, it could be in, in someone's apartment. We could have multiple ones. That, if we have enough sign-ups for it, we could have it in multiple locations. Uh, but imagine, start praying, God, who might be in my life who I could bring to this Alpha course? We share a meal together. We watch this video. We, we discuss these things. We get to know each other. We go on this journey, this spiritual journey together. The idea of judgment really should be fuel to motivate us to think harder and to have more faith and more desire to do this kind of thing. Let's get back to the parable that we were talking about. So Jesus tells this parable, and he refers, to, so he's the farmer in the parable, the son of man, as Jesus commonly referred to himself as. Uh, he's the farmer, and the, the, the field that he talks about that this farmer owns is, is the world, and then the farmers come with these good seeds, and the farmer is spreading these good seeds around, and that's uh, the seed represents, I guess, the, the seed of faith that gets sown. And for those who believe, for, if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, the, the good seed has entered your heart. And then that seed grows up into a life of righteousness, a life for God, a life that's lived out to glorify God. And then in the parable, we're told that there's an enemy that's come. And this, the, we're told the enemy is the devil. That We talked about that last week. Uh, and that he has now sown uh, weeds. And uh, these weeds that have been sown... They're, they're referred to as the sons of the evil one. Now, we shouldn't think about people as like literal offspring of Satan, but I mean, you know, Jesus does call the Pharisees like the sons of the devil. So there, there is a sense in which, you think about it like this, it's more like somebody kind of a strongly associates their identity with like a sports team or some kind of group or something. Think about it more, more like that, 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 that the, the seed of this weed, gets, if it, if it gets, takes root in your own heart, then you, what you grow in your life is, is a really a life that, that doesn't glorify God, but glorifies uh, the devil. And so the, the, what the Scripture is so clear about is there's only two options. There's only two kingdoms, kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness. If you're not in one, by default, you're in the other one. That's how this works. And then the harvest is judgment day. This is the return of Jesus. This is the accountability for all mankind. And uh, Jesus is very very clever in, in using these, these illustrations for the, especially the people of the day, because in, in Roman law, it was actually, it was, it was maybe punishable, I believe, by death if you sowed weeds in uh, somebody else's field. And this is something that people would do, you know, competition between farmers or just, you know, people are angry, want to get back at each other. And so uh, certain weeds you could sow that looked just like 
um, wheat before the, the wheat actually gets the, the, the head on it. So as they're coming up, you cannot tell the difference. You don't know. So they're growing. You, you have to wait until actually the fruit is produced. And then once you see the fruit, you know the root, right? You, you can see, okay, one is good and one, one is bad. Then the reapers that we're told about here that actually come and separate the, the wheat from the, the weeds, the reapers are God's angels. And that was week one of our series, right? That we learned that angels are these ministering spirits, that they work on our behalf to protect us, to help us, to do God's bidding and God's will. And they are involved in Judgment Day. They've got a very important role in Judgment Day. And they, they actually come and rescue us. Their, their, their purpose is to bring about, uh, uh, by their own hands, you know, obviously salvation is God's work, but, but they're involved in the application of it, that they save us out of judgment to bring us into God's barn, right? The wheat going into God's barn, and then obviously the weeds going into the fire, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, a little bit longer. A few things that we can learn about judgment. Four things we can learn about judgment. Number one, that Jesus is judge. Jesus is judge. In Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, verse 42, says this, Peter, the apostle Peter, is preaching about Jesus. And then he says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. If you like Jesus, if you respect Jesus, if you think that Jesus is good and righteous and honorable, if you think that he, because he's God in the flesh, that he then can associate with our weaknesses, that he... Um, is very gracious towards us, very understanding of our, our plight and our circumstances, that if you trust him and you think he is holy and good and that you, you honor him, you have any, any sense of, of positive feelings about Jesus, you should be so glad that he is judge. He is judge. This gives me great confidence and great comfort because I, I know this because I have the utmost respect for Jesus, the utmost confidence in, in the assessment of Jesus and the purity of Jesus and the, the righteousness of Jesus and also the mercy and the grace of Jesus. And so having that confidence, I know that his judgments will be exactly what they need to be. And I can trust in them and I can be, I can rest, be rest assured in them. Even if, it's, even if it's a troubling idea in general, I can rest assured that it's Jesus who is judged. The second thing we learn about judgment is that all people will be judged by varying degree or with varying degree. This is a confusing thing, an unknown, commonly unknown thing for Christians. There's a spectrum here. The, the, the decision-making, the, the judgment of Jesus upon assessing people's lives, there's a spectrum that happens. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Both believers and unbelievers will be judged, will be judged. Let me explain it, I'll get into this. Those who don't believe, they will be judged, but it will be by degrees. So for those who perhaps their sin has been more severe, it will be greater degrees of, of judgment and therefore lighter degrees of judgment for others. Now you might be saying, well, wait a second, how are Christians judged? Isn't there, isn't there a verse in, in John? There is, John 5, John 5 verse 24. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. So Christians are now, we're not judged for our wrong deeds. This is the gospel message, is that Jesus is judged for our sin. So we are not judged. But we already learned earlier on in Revelation that we still stand before the judgment throne and books are opened. And so, how, so how can we not be judged but still be judged? We will be judged on judgment day, not for our wrong works. Jesus takes those. We'll be judged for our good works. This is actually a wonderful truth about the Christian faith that's greatly misunderstood. It is the foundation of Jesus. When we have faith in Jesus, that seed of faith that, we, that gets sowed in our lives by the Son of Man, by, the, by Jesus, that's the foundation. That's the entry to heaven. That's what secures us forever. On top of that life, we can build, well, the fruit of that is a life of righteousness that grows out. Now, you can squander it. Christians can. They can waste their time. They can do all kinds of live their life without really much you know, engaging in God's purposes. And so as they enter heaven, they will kind of, a lot of that will be burned up. They'll, they'll get in because of the foundation, but a lot of what they achieved in their life may not come to much. 
But those who really trusted God and did the good works of the kingdom will build a life of righteousness that then God will remember and honor forever. And there will be additional rewards given. Many verses talk about this. Additional rewards given based on how they've lived their life. It's a glorious truth. It's a motivating thing for Christians to actually think about. God sees everything I do. Now, I think at the moment of, of being judged for our good works, yes, there might, be, there might be some sense of loss or disappointment in that moment. There could be. That could be the case. But in heaven, once we're there, there, there won't be any sense of comparison or loss. It's hard for us to imagine these things, but it'll be, it'll be good all around, no matter what everyone ends up with. It'll be good all around, because the greatest prize, of course, is God himself. The third thing we learn about judgment is that demons will be judged. So on Judgment Day, demons will be judged. We're getting this from uh, the second letter of, of Peter, the Apostle Peter, Second Peter. He talks about this, that on Judgment Day, the demons themselves will be judged. And this is something that should give us actually a lot of gratitude. Because last week we talked about the works of demons and how destructive they are and how evil they are and how corrupt they are. There's no hope for them. We don't have any compassion for demons. There's, there's no grace for them. There's only judgment for them. And they've, I mean, think about all the, all the suicides they've caused, all the marriages they've destroyed, all the, all the harm they've done to people, all the glory they've stolen from God. They will pay greatly. And on, on Judgment Day, they will be judged. Now, that's really the only sense of, 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 of something positive that we should really have about judgment. Christians, by and large, we should be extremely sorrowful and we should be troubled by judgment. God himself does not delight in this. And of course, there's a sense of sorrow, especially for people that we know and love that don't believe in Jesus. I'm always a bit nervous and concerned about Christians who are like gleeful about judgment, talking about that. It's a wicked, strange thing to me. It doesn't quite seem right. But we, we, we should have that strength of, of, of certainty and gratitude of like the forces of evil, that, that these demonic forces, they will be judged for what they've done. They will be held accountable for what they've done. Thank God. For that, but then, but then also, on the same token, a sense of sorrow of what could have been perhaps, but it's been lost. See this, uh, or at least, sorry, the next point, uh, point number, uh, what's the next point? Let's go with the next one. Number four, Christians help with the judging. Now, this is very peculiar. I don't know. I don't know about this, but I got a verse for you. First Corinthians 6, verse 2 and 3, it says, uh, Apostle Paul writes this, Apostle Paul always getting us in trouble saying the, the things, saying the things. He says, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? I said, I know I didn't know that actually. Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? We don't know how this works. Of course, it doesn't take away that Jesus is the main judge. It's the main judge, Jesus. Glad for that, because I, I don't know if I want some people judging me. You know, I, I don't know if I want that. But somehow, we're, so I guess you know, one application is we need to get better. Our powers of discernment need to be trained more to actually figure out what is God's will? What is right and wrong? How does God judge? What is God's justice like? What does it mean? What's, how does his grace work? How does his mercy work? How, does, how do his penalties work? Actually grappling with those things, growing with those things. It's a peculiar thing that somehow will be involved in the process of judging. Both the world and demons and angels, perhaps. I don't know how it all works, but perhaps it works. But it kind of makes sense. It's kind of fitting. Because if you actually look at biblical history, God does share judgment with us. He gives judge, judging powers to us. I mean, there's a whole book in the Bible called Judges. All right, it should be a big clue. Judges. Uh, so, you know, you've got spiritual leaders in, in the Bible, you know, judging kings of the Old Testament, you know, judge, people ruling and judging. Uh, it says very clearly in Scripture that God's given authority to governments to administer judgments, right, to, make, to determine the outcome of a crime, that God's delegated that to them. That's, that's our human responsibility in human governments to actually bring about justice and judgment. I mean, it, it's true for, you know, parents, have to bring judgments on their kids. You know, elders in churches as well are given the authority to bring about judgments, to make decisions about things, all kind of different judgments going on. So it makes sense that God, now God's going to expand this, it seems, in heaven. This is going to be an expanded responsibility. He's going to share it with all his followers who are going to be involved in the work of sorting things out, looking through history, figuring out how the judgments apply, what it means. It's kind of an exciting, it reframes the idea of the afterlife, some of the things that we'll be, that we'll be doing, that we'll be involved in. 
So the idea of judgment is, is, is easier to, to think about because you're determining, you're assessing, you're analyzing like what's right and wrong. And Let's talk about punishment. This is the hardest one. This is the hardest one. Let's look at the last two verses of the parable in Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42. Jesus says this, The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Next week we'll talk about the shining kingdom. We'll talk about paradise. We'll talk about heaven. That'll be a lot more exciting. But we have to grapple. We have to grapple with this. So Jesus is depicting hell. And Jesus said a lot about hell. In fact, Jesus said more about hell than, than anyone else. I mean, he talks about hell more than really anyone else does. So all of our, a lot of our teaching about hell comes directly from Jesus. He, he liked to talk about it. We have to be careful when we're looking at parables and we're looking at apocryphal language about the afterlife, about punishment, because they are metaphors and and, and, and it's apocryphal visionary language. So we have to be careful about that. Let me give an example why you have to be careful. In one place, hell is referred to as utter darkness, right? gloomy, utter darkness. In other places, it's, it's referred to as a lake of fire. Those are actually incompatible images because fire produces light. So it's not a contradiction, but what you have to realize is the Bible is trying to portray to us something that we actually probably can't imagine in different metaphors and images to help give us an idea of how it works and what it's like. So we can get, what you can't do is you can't get rid of the idea of judgment, but we have to be very humble and very careful about being too, too specific about what we do know and what we don't know. Just as we talked about things about angels and things about demons, there's things we know and things we're not sure about, some things, there's some assumptions, some, some kind of guesswork, if you will, some suggestions or assumptions that you can make Maybe more this, maybe more that. We have to be very careful about it. But it's a, it's a terrifying idea to think of, of, of God giving punishment to people forever for what they've done. Let's look at some signs of mercy that even in judgment God shows, signs of mercy that God shows even in judgment. There are many, many passages of Scripture that seem to point out to us that children, all children, will be saved from judgment. All children will be saved from judgment. Jesus said, let the, the little children come to me. God, in his great mercy and great grace and great wisdom, I believe, I believe there's many passages you could look to that says he brings them into, safely into his kingdom, in his future kingdom. You know, the thing about the parable, God, you know, the angels are like, the, the reapers are like, well, maybe we should go and get these weeds out now. And, and, and the, the farmer's like, no, 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 don't do it because you're not going to better tell which is which, because they look identical. You have to wait until there's more fruit so you can see, and, and that's very clear. Jesus says you know, you'll know them by their fruit, right? God's saying even the angels can't tell. Now, there are some, even some problems with that idea, perhaps, but think about it like this. We might, salvation belongs to the Lord. We might be surprised by some who make it into heaven and some who don't. We have to be very humble. We don't know all the outcomes. We don't know. Now, we've got, to be, we've got to be very humble. We can't say we know this for certain or not for certain. We don't know. We, we have, that's why we trust God with it. Consider this act of mercy as well, that for some people, because there are degrees of punishment, as there are degrees of reward, that for some people it might be actually quite mild. I don't know how far you can push that, but because Jesus indicates there are degrees, that some people's sin is very severe. Some people, is, some people you know, they don't believe in God, but they... They, they, they can live moral lives. You know, they can do good things. So actually, their experience may be very mild. Now, Scripture does seem to indicate that this, this punishment is eternal. And, so, and we can think of like the, the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Maos of, of history that we would say, yes, stick them in the eternal thing, throw away the key. Like, great, great. We're all on board with that. Good decision. We're all on board with that. But, but there are others we think of, we think, oh, is that, how does that work? We don't know. We don't know for a fact. But let me suggest a possibility. This could be, could be, mention, know that I said could be, Matthew 10, Matthew 10, 28. It could be that some people's judgment 
could lead to a spiritual death. It's uncertain. Matthew 10, 28 says, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. These signs, all these signs of, of mercy can give us a lot of comfort, especially in our sorrow of those that we know and love but don't know Jesus. But putting all that aside, here's what we, here's what we know, here's what we do know, here's what we can be certain of. That hell is essentially a prison that God is going to create, that he's going to confine all four, all, Satan and demons, they're going to be confined into this eternal prison that they will, it will be impossible to escape from. So that God's good creation, the new heavens and the new earth, God's good creation will be safe from all forces, that the worst forces of evil that have ever existed, they'll be confined, they'll be restrained forever. That's good news. That's really good news. It's part of the gospel, good news that we have. That you know, our heart's greatest desire is to be free from suffering, to be free from evil, to have joy, to know God, to be known, to be secure forever. And, we, and, and knowing this, knowing that this is God's plan, that all demons... Because you think about all the evil things that they've done, all the things we talked about last week, of the attacks that we sustained, that the lies that they speak, that the, the accusations they make against us, the temptations they bring towards us, all of that will be locked away forever. Because some people wonder, well, heaven, you know, aren't we in danger? If people fell, if angels fell and people fell when, before really sin came into the world, like, couldn't that happen again in heaven? The answer to that is hell. Without hell... God's people cannot be safe from evil. To have an eternal paradise where you are safe, where the snake can't get back into the garden, because you're always like, where did that snake come from? came out of nowhere. To be certain that it would be impossible for any forces of evil to ever make it back, God has made a chasm that cannot be crossed. It's impossible that's why, it's a, that's why it has to be an eternal separation, confined in, in a maximum security facility, all forces of evil, locked away, praise God, forever. Now, I said it's impossible to come out. There's actually one person that did it, the greatest escape artist of all time. The, greatest, the only person, only, only God can escape hell. Jesus is God incarnate. Golgotha, the place of the skull, the crucifixion of Jesus, that was that spiritual cage, if you will, that place of torment and punishment where Jesus was crushed for all of our sins. But, he, but also, he, judgment was satisfied there, but also he survived it. He died and resurrected and escaped, escaped that place of hell. And I, actually, you know, I said it's impossible. Only, only one person escaped it, but actually anyone who's in Jesus also escaped it. Only because of the greatest escape artist, Jesus, are we now also set free because we, we were objects of wrath destined for destruction, but now we're, we're saved from that. Let me illustrate it like this. In the days of the pioneers, if people were to see a, a prairie fire in the distance, they knew that not even the fastest horse that they had could outrun the fire. So people would take a match and they would light a designated area of grass and they would stand in the area. And when the fire came, it would pass around them and they would not be touched by it because the place where they stood had already had fire go through it. There's only one safe place, the place where judgment has already burned through, and that is on the ashes of Jesus, on the death of Jesus, on the grave of Jesus. And if you stand in that place, you'll be safe forever. This is the gospel. Let's, have, let's celebrate. Let's have the band come up. Let's celebrate. It's a perfect opportunity to sing and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. There's only one safe place. Yes, judgment is a terrible idea. Yes, it's an awful thing to think about. But we can trust. We can trust that it's good, necessary. God will do it perfectly, and you can be saved from it. Today, we should be in awe of God's love and God's justice. We should be in awe of God's love and God's justice. Let's respond today. If you don't know Jesus, come into his family. Turn from your sin. If you want to be baptized, we're actually planning baptisms very soon. So respond, get baptized. If you need prayer, if you want to give today, you want to join a small group, you want to get involved at Trinity, the way you can respond is uh, you can text the word ENJOY to 94,000, different ways to respond there. I encourage you to take a step today.
You know what feels really good? Hitting that beautiful like button. It's just sitting right there all alone with nothing to do. Help it live to its fullest potential. You know what else feels really good? Embracing that subscribe button. It's like a puppy begging for attention. Just showing it a little bit of love goes a long way. Like and subscribe.